So Carla Garcia, technical services specialist at Port Americas, Mexico, and CEO at Microgreens. Thank you so much for joining me on the Vertical Farming Podcast. Hi, Harry. Thank you so much for having me. Where in Mexico are you calling in from today? So right now I'm in Hermosillo, Sonora. So it's very close to Arizona. Okay. Yeah. And how hot weather? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little colder here, so I'm sure you're getting a bit warmer weather than I am. Yeah, we don't have autumn here, so <laughs> no summer. <laughs> yeah. So where is home for you? Here's my hometown. You born and raised there? Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was life like? If you can take us back a little bit and you know, growing up there, you know, what are some memories you have of growing up there? So here is a kind of small town, but not a lot of traffic. You know, Mexican people is very warm. I have lived in the United States too, but since the beginning, I wanted to start like my own business. So that's why I decided to come back and uh, just try to do something for my hometown. That's why I'm still here. So, and now trying to make things also for the country. So it's a nice city. It's not the best weather, I would say. <laughs> But we have the beach really close, so. It's yeah. Nice. And so you mentioned this desire to open your business. Is that a desire you've had since you were little? This idea of being like in business for yourself or being an mm -hmm. entrepreneur? That's a good question. <laughs> Not really. When I was little, I loved science. Science okay. I was very, very little. But when I started to study, I'm a biologist, yeah. by the way. So when I started, I started my career as a biologist. I found that a lot of people were like asking me, like, how are you going to live? Like, what kind of job are you going to get? And I love plants and I love plant physiology. So I decided to put my knowledge on what is more practical. So that's why I moved to agriculture and working there, I decided to start my business. So Okay. But, yeah. <laughs> so when you went to university and you were studying that passion for biology and, and plants, is that something you remember from, from early on? Yeah. At the beginning, I liked like all kind of like different organisms. Yeah. But when I was studying is when I found out about plant physiology, which I think is uh, very interesting. I mean, other organisms can, you know, move and find a place where, I don't know, they can have shade or something. Yeah. And plants uh, cannot move. So they develop a lot of very interesting stuff inside of them. So that's why I really like the topic in Science of the Beginning. I start working in, it was an ecophysiology lab at, at that time. And from there, I start to move to agriculture. <laughs> mm. And so as you started to work in this field, did you think about the jobs you were going to have when you were in university and you think about like what you're going to apply to and where do you like to work and what type of careers where you have? How did that change? <laughs> if you think about like what dreams you had of the type of job or your dream job when you were in university and how that's developed and evolved over the years. So when I started, I was thinking on uh, working at university, you know, like a faculty member okay. of the university. And I think that's the way they structure like the biology career. I mean, they yeah. want to guide you in that way. So that was what I was thinking at the beginning. But I really find like some issues when doing research, at least for the side in like in the biology area, that a lot of research is not very practical and at least in here in mexico for example if you want to get funding for a specific research you need to show how that research is going to help something right okay. and for the community not only for the ecology which also is really important but from there i started to think about okay i need to to not only do science but to do something that i can prove that is helping in any kind of business so that's why I changed uh, in the middle. I wanted to do like a PhD and everything. And I started actually a PhD. Yeah. But on the way, I really wanted to work on industry and to let the people on the industry know what people doing research is doing, which mm. is uh, the thing that I do right now. That's my job right now. It's yeah. trying to connect what the people is, I mean, the scientists are doing right now with the growers, which I think this, there is a huge bridge between these two uh, groups. Yeah. So that's why I decided to change when I was studying. Is there any history in your family with like farming or horticulture? Or I'm, I'm curious how this, <laughs> thinking of you as a little girl, maybe like <laughs> what were some of your yeah. inspirations growing up? 
Not at all. My father is a, a chemical engineer. Okay. And my mom is, she studied like very similar to biology, but okay. with chemistry. Okay. Um, so I did have the background of science, yeah. but not farming at all. Right now, my father, he's already retired and he's farming okay. in a small, in a small place that he has. But from my, I mean, when I was a child, I didn't have any kind of family member working on farming. So. Yeah. And what was it about, as you started to learn more about plant physiology, and then obviously we can talk about your, as you started working with Hort Americas, what was it that kept pulling you in or kept fascinating you? And I'm sure the more you learned, the more you became fascinated with all the dynamics of how plants work and how they respond to their environment and how they respond to different stimulus. And I'm sure that, how was that experience for you as you learned more about how the nature of how plants work actually? So when applying knowledge, you get to know a lot. I would, I love to analyze data, for example. Yeah. So every time that I have data from my business or even from other people's business, because we do also consulting, for me, that's really exciting because you get to know like how the plant is behaving and what things can you do inside of the greenhouse or the plant factory in order to adjust everything. So that for me, is really exciting. But other area that's kind of different is teaching. I really enjoy teaching and look how the people use the information and find a way to succeed on projects. So that's, I think, is the most important job that I have right now. Yeah. And it's what is making me like more happy about my job. So talk to me about how you became connected with the group at Hort Americas and how that position started. So that's a funny story because I met Chris, which is the director of Fort Americans, in one of the meetings that I was presenting my research when I was in grad school. So Dr. Sherry Kubota was my advisor. She's a great researcher. So she introduced me to Chris Higgins. And when I finished and I moved back to Mexico, I posted some pictures about my small microgreens facility. And he started to ask me like, oh, are you starting a business of microgreens? And then we start a conversation and I made a video about the farm and everything. And I shared that with him and I started to use the lamps that Hort Americas sell and with great results. And I think it started there. And then I ended up being a technical service <laughs> for them. And what was those early days at Hort Americas? What were your responsibilities and how has that changed over time? So at the beginning, I was uh, just uh, solving questions from customers, like just getting emails. And I mean, I love that kind of job because you can help people. But at the same time, I was doing short courses here in Mexico by myself. And I started to think like, I mean, we can also do that. And I was also like uploading pictures, like trying to teach more. Okay. So then we started to like, to do a combination of what I was doing here also with Fort Americas, which I think is making like the technical service way more complete. So we started with videos at the beginning. We have a YouTube channel and I was like really exciting about like uploading videos. I'm not the best like recording myself speaking, <laughs> but at least I wanted to share information. So I started to create a lot of videos and we found that people like really like that kind of information. And then we moved to the chart courses. So we started with just solving questions from customers to provide videos. We developed some guides. So I was able like, to write guides about how to grow tomatoes or microgreens or different crops. And then the chart courses. And now we're moving to consulting. So I think we have been growing a lot on the technical side of the company. And that is something that made Fort America different from other companies and people like come to us in, in, you know, the events just to tell us like, thank you for all the information that you are sharing on the social media and you know, on the webpage. For the listener or the viewer who's not familiar with the services that Hort Americas provides, can you give a brief overview of, of everything that's available on the website and with the services? Sure. We focus a lot on everything that is related to controlled environment agriculture and hydroponics. So we manage different products like light. Lighting is one of the products that we sell the most. And we also focus on fertilizer, substrates, some sensors too, along with the technical service. So that is something really special for us. We don't want just to sell products. We want people to find the tools to use the products and be able to select what they want based on, the, on their knowledge. 
rather than we convince them to buy the products. So that I think is uh, one of the objectives of the company. So we sell products and we have some services too. What type of questions do you typically get from people that are submitting to you? Is it first time farmers? Is it companies looking to get started? What's the general mix of the questions and the technical support mm, that people are looking I, for? I think it's a little bit of everything, but mostly more like commercial growers. We get a lot of questions about the use of fertilizer most of the time. Mm. That's why I develop, we have a guide, we have a okay. lot of videos because we really feel like the need of teaching how to use fertilizers. Like people, I think it's uh, used to just read instruction and just follow whatever is written on the fertilizer. But sometimes you need to do a little bit more, right? Like to check the water source, just the fertilizer and the management through the cycle. So we get a lot of questions about that and also about organic production. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have also an organic fertilizer. So we also get a lot of questions about how to manage this fertilizer over time. You know, organic production can be a, real, a little bit more difficult than yeah. traditional, but very helpful. So yeah, I think that topic is one of the most common one when like looking to the emails and questions. So you mentioned you had been doing some work with your own farm. So if we could just also rewind the clock a little bit back. And I'm curious about your inspiration for starting your own microgreens company, how that came about. So when I was in uh, the University of Arizona, where I was doing my master's degree, then I learned about vertical farming and the use of artificial lighting with Dr. Sherry Kubota. So when I came back to Mexico, I really wanted not just to start a company and, you know, like start to make money, which is important, <laughs> but I wanted to make something different and find a way that I can teach people here in Mexico, like things that I know people those know a lot. So actually I started with a short course of greenhouse design. And at the same time, I was developing my own company and I really want to like to invite people to see what I was doing. So I think the the reason why I started, it was that, I mean, to find a way to teach people how to produce food in a different way inside of the cities. And of course, at the beginning, I was struggling to make business because I live in a small town. We don't have a lot of restaurants here. So at the same time, I was like teaching the short courses to try to push the, with the name of the microgreens company so people get to know about the company too. So that's the way I started. But the main purpose of the company and until today, I think is is the same purpose because now I connect my company to Puerto Rico, Mexico, and people can come and see. Now we have like a showroom for the microgreens and people come to see the business and the micro business is still small, but it's profitable. So yeah, <laughs> that's how I end up on with a microgreens. <laughs> I'm curious about your choice of microgreens and I'm just curious about it from a cultural perspective because I, and maybe it's different. And I'm wondering, is that a common crop in Mexico or, or is there a bit of a learning curve for people to understand, you know, how to incorporate it into Mexican, traditional Mexican dishes? So that was the challenge because it's not common at all. I mean, here is common for restaurants. I mean, chefs yeah. know the problem. Yeah. But people, I mean, it's regular people that go to the supermarket, they didn't know the product. So at the beginning, it was a little bit challenging, but I decided to start it because it was the cheapest way to start. I mean, it's not the, like, you need way more money to start a greenhouse and yeah. produce the lettuce. And that's something that I teach now because I know a lot of young people that they want to start like a small business, but they don't have a lot of, you know, money to start. So that was my case. So that's why I decided to start with a small microgreens I, a company. And I, did, I knew at the moment that it would be difficult because, I mean, I have the restaurants, but I need to teach people what microgreens and the difference between the sprouts and all those kind of things. So it was challenging at the beginning, but I think it took me like one year and a half to get people to recognize the product and to be more relaxed in terms of the business. I develop products that I know people here in Mexico, for example, people look a lot for like healthy products or products that can be like, you know, from a natural source that can be helpful for diseases. Yeah. 
So when I was doing the microgreens production, I started also to grow wheatgrass and then to do, you know, the extract and the shots. So then I took the attention from then, you know, the normal people that go to the supermarket. And then from that, I start to know a little bit more about like, you know, these are the microgreens and you can, you can also eat them. Sounds like there's a lot of education involved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> While at the same time, all the challenges that come with running your own business, the marketing, you know, the operations and, and, all, and all building that. Did you have mentors that were helping you, you know, figure out some of those challenges along the way? Because it's, it's a lot of, I'm being an entrepreneur myself, I know there's a lot of moving parts and having your own business and you have to wear many hats and sometimes you have to do boring stuff like accounting and sometimes you have to do marketing and sometimes you have to do, yeah. you know, the actual farming itself. So I'm, I'm wondering what that's been like for you. Yeah, you need to learn a little bit about everything and a lot of things that you don't say. I mean, uh, things that's, that in school, they don't teach you, right? So I didn't have a mentor like like for the business, but I read a lot, like tons of books about how to manage a business and how to don't give up at the beginning, <laughs> you know, like, like try to shore up yourself. So yeah, I, I didn't have anyone like like teaching me, but I'm very curious about any topic. So I, for example, for social media, I found a way to like really learn about Facebook and yeah. Instagram because right now that's really important. And now I'm mentor for other people that is in other business not related to horticulture. You know, my friends, some of my husband, and I teach them how to use this. Tools. But yeah, the beginning, I didn't, I didn't have anyone to reach, but every time I go to conferences, I try to speak with people and it's not like I have a one mentor, but I try to soak information from people. Yeah. So that's, it's something helpful too. It's really good to connect, you know, also, for example, with Chris Higgins, like obviously ask for advice on how to manage a company, but I don't have like a one person to reach. It would be great. <laughs> if you had to give yourself advice or someone who's starting a similar type business now that you've, you know, you've got all these ex the years of experience and you made the mistakes and you learned what to do and what not to do. And I'm sure you're still learning along the way, but if you had to go back and maybe give, you know, 2018, 2017, Carla, some advice, <laughs> what advice would you give? One that is like related to the business is you need to organize everything before starting, I mean, how much for are going to produce, where are going to sell the product, like different options, you know, the one with the top price and also the last option that you want, but you have to have the option too. I think that's really important. You need to like really structure everything at the beginning. And sometimes when we have an idea, it's like, oh, I had this idea and we start and we end up doing all the structure at, at the end when we are like having problems. So for me, it was kind of that way. So right now, when I provide consulting for the customers, I do that for them. Like, let's see, which is your area? How much product can you produce in one week? Where do you want to sell that product? So I think that's really important. And uh, other aspects that are not like related directly to the business is, you know, your mind, how is your setup on these kind of situations? You need to have a lot of discipline. Uh, you don't have someone telling you what to do. So you need to learn to be your own boss and be there for your company. It doesn't matter the time or the, the hour and the day. And also to don't get disappointed when you don't have good results, mm. because I mean, that's something expected. If you are very lucky, you probably won't have the bad results, but I think that's really important. You need to learn that it's on the way. You need to overcome those kind of problems and uh, to find a way if you have a goal to try to go to the goal and uh, maybe the pathway will be a little bit different from what you were thinking at the beginning. But if you have a goal, you find a way. So I think that's really important too. And I have seen that when helping my friends and different people that is in different businesses, that's really important because sometimes we give up before like trying enough. So I think that's also good advice. <laughs> Very helpful advice, especially for people that are getting started. I know that anything around vertical farming, small farms, even microgreens is getting a lot of attention. And I think people need to have a realistic expectation of, of what's involved and how much work it is and what the challenges are. And, and I think the more research people do, the better off they'll be. Do you see 
a change in the people in, in Mexico in terms of entrepreneurism? I know obviously coming from the States, that's very, it's very big, like everyone's an entrepreneur. <laughs> but do you see that changing in Mexico where more and more people are taking an interest in starting their own business and starting their own farms? A lot because I think the new generations, they now think a little bit different. Yeah. So right now we have a lot, and I have seen that through the years, like working with the students, I teach her courses, so I get to know people at the university. So right now, a lot of people, they want to have their own business. And before we were like in the setup, like I'm going to finish and find a job. So now I think we'll say at least 30% of the classroom will say, I want to start my own business and I don't want to find a job. I mean, on the way, obviously you sometimes need to work, but that is really different from before. I mean, even myself, as I told you, I didn't think that to have my own business when I was studying. So yeah, I think it's, it, it, people is starting to think differently. Also, sometimes people want to have like very things in a very easy way of the new generations. That's also something that I have seen, but they will know in certain point that things are not that easy, but at least it's good that they have now, you know, this ambition of having their own business. Yeah, you definitely need that work ethic. You have to be able to roll up your sleeves and work long days in the beginning and realize that sometimes you're the only person, especially as a business owner, that's some of the challenges sometimes to realize that when you come up with problems, there's no one going to come to save you. <laughs> you have to go. You have to figure yeah. it out on yourself. Yeah, and and no one is going to shoot you up, so you have to shoot you up yourself. Too. Yeah, self motivate. <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious in your time as uh, at Hort Americas, when did you start to see more interest specifically in vertical farming? Because you said you know it's obviously controlled environment agriculture, and obviously there's a lot of years and things you've been reporting on from the greenhouse perspective. And I'm curious if you started to notice a shift at some point where. Obviously, like now, a lot of people are talking about vertical farming specifically. And I'm curious, from your perspective, what you started seeing from your time at, at Hard Americas. So for United States, you know, it's kind of, uh, it's not like a trend because yeah. sometimes, you know, we have these big companies that are not doing well. So people start to think bad about vertical farming, but then we have people that is interested. It's kind of, you know, moving in different ways. But here in Mexico, it's like, it's very, very strong movement, like to an increase in interest, in interest in vertical farming. I think it's from like one year from now, like one year and a half, a lot of different people, like it's uh, reaching us now with bigger ambition. At the beginning, it was like just small farmers, like doing microgreens or lettuce, but in a very small facilities. But now we have like investors and um, so that's different from the past year, probably. So we find people more interested, like one year and a half, like in general. But one year from now, we have people like, you know, like investors, like bigger projects. And so, yeah, the, the here we had that trend, like people is increasing the interest in vertical farming. And in the United States, at least from from what I can see in uh, on the industry working with Horta Americas, is it's kind of a, it's I would say it doesn't move a lot, but still it's a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people is interested in vertical farming. And so I'm curious, thanks to Jessica for introducing us as well, and she talked a little bit about the community that's being created. And I know because it's so, you know, it's smaller in Mexico, I think she mentioned you have a, a WhatsApp group. And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about how that's been helpful to have, you know, at least the people that are interested in vertical farming or CEA in Mexico have a place where you can, you know, talk ideas and, and talk together. Yeah, so we don't have a lot of people with experience on vertical farming. So I'm one of the persons that people can reach if they want to learn about the use of lighting. So I have taken the lead on that. I want to connect all the people that is doing work on vertical farming. So I'm the one like, creating the WhatsApp groups because I really want them to to know that we are not competition right now because, I mean, we are just few and we yeah. need to push this topic like all together. So yeah. that's why I always speak with the, the biggest companies that we have right now in vertical farming. 
And I try to connect them with the other people and try to connect them also with people in the United States that I know can be helpful for them. So that, I think, is my purpose right now when I was telling you that I wanted to come back and do something for my hometown. Right now, I think I'm doing for the country and also Latin America, <laughs> some people from other countries in Latin America. So the group is actually not just Mexico, it's other people in, in Spanish-speaking countries who are interested as well? Uh, yeah. I mean, we have people from Puerto Rico, Costa Rica, um, Peru. Okay. And what else? And Chile. Oh, Chile. Well, that's great. Yeah. And I think it's interesting with those, a lot of those places are traditionally people think they have maybe the perfect climate. You think about Puerto Rico and you think about Chile and it's like, it's always sunny. Like, why do they even need to think about like vertical farming? But I think with the changes in climate and not having the consistency of, you know, what you need if you want to grow crops year round, I think, is that some of the conversations you're seeing or hearing or the people or the challenges people are facing? Yes. And from people in Latin America, I mean, outside of Mexico, we speak a lot about problems related with drought. So I think right now people is worried about that situation. And that's why they are thinking in this kind of business, not only vertical farming, but also hydroponics. And what are you seeing or in terms of the conversations or where are you seeing the most promise for opportunities? Do you see it's really partnerships with bigger companies? You know, obviously you've got a lot of people with experience from Europe and Holland with the greenhouses and companies that are having some success in the States as well. So for the potential for vertical farming within Latin American countries, it, where do you see the potential there? Is it partnerships or is it just learning what's working, what's not to make better decisions? I think it would be both. It would be good to have like partnerships with people that is doing way better than us. Yeah. And to get to learn more. So every city is different. So I think it's important also to get to know how the business is going in different places. But if we can learn from someone else, partnership with something bigger than us, that, that's also helpful. So where do you see, as you think about the potential and what you're, because you're at Horde Americas, I imagine you have a, a front row seat to seeing what's happening in this industry and the changes that are happening. And I'm sure there's a lot of reporting that you have access to so you can see, you know, where everything is moving. So what's your take on what's happening with some of the recent closings, restructurings? Obviously, those are the things that make a lot of news, right? When you hear of companies shutting down or shutting down operations. But when you think about the bigger picture and the potential for vertical farming, I'm curious about what your perspective is. I think vertical farming is very helpful, but we need to evaluate the projects in advance. It's just the advice that I provide before, because some of the projects are like very big and very ambitious. And we don't have like, at that time, we didn't have like a history on how to do business with that kind of company, like very big. So that's why we have seen some companies like that didn't develop in the best way, but I think that is not because the vertical farm is not working. It's because the way the projects are developed. And I think one advice could be like to start with a small or medium size and you can learn in the way and get bigger because it could be kind of risky if you don't know the business, if you don't know, you just, as I mentioned, every city is different. So you need to study that with this new technology. And I think the best way to do it is from a small to bigger size. And so as you think about the what's next for you in terms of what you're developing, I, what I noticed and I hear a lot in this conversation is this idea of teaching and teaching and showing and teaching. Is that something that's always been important for you to just, you know, I feel like you have this need or this passion for teaching other people how to learn these things and how to farm? Yes, for me, this is a kind of passion. Not only teaching, I like to teach with a purpose that people can get tools for doing things that they want. So yeah, I think on the way I want to find different ways to help people to start their own business. I think that's kind of the thing that I like the most. As I mentioned, I even help people that doesn't work on their horticulture business. So I think that's my passion is to like to try to leave a print other people so they can overcome problems and be successful on things that can make them happy. Is that something that you learned from your family or is that where I'm curious <laughs> where that drive comes from? 
So I think people will say I had been this way like forever. But my grandmother, she was, you know, like very, she paid a lot of attention to people mm -hmm. and, and I spent a lot of my childhood with her. So I think I learned that from her, like to pay attention and provide advice. And since I was like very little and I grew this way and now that I have knowledge, now I'm directing <laughs> my knowledge into the area of horticulture. So I'm thinking about all the things that you're working on. You've got your business and the support you provide at, at Hort Americas as well. So what does like a typical day look like for you in terms of, you know, all the things that you have on your plate? Yeah. And so I can tell you like from before when I started, I was teaching short courses for a company and also starting my own business and being technical service. So I divide my day in the morning. I was working for that company, like to get the registrations for the short courses. Then from noon, like to, I will say like 5 PM, I will work for microgreens, which is my company, microgreens FLN. And the rest of the day until 11 p.m., I was working as technical service. So that was before. And now that I have, you know, a team here, people that is helping me for microgreen cell phone, I, I don't manage the company right now. I have someone helping me with that. Yeah. So right now I work like from kind of 6 a.m. to I will say 6 p.m. And I really want to start like very early to evaluate the things that I need to do within the day. Otherwise, I cannot make everything function. So I need to make a list, what we need to do for microgreens, what we need to do for Puerto Ricas, Mexico, and also anything that should be done for Puerto Ricas, United States. So, yeah, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a, a lot of work, but I really enjoy my job. Yeah, so. sounds like you definitely have a full day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So do you make it out to conferences at all as well? Yeah, we typically try to go at least two or three conferences. We now get a lot of invitations. I'm planning to be in two weeks in North Carolina okay. for the Vegetable Course Association. So I'm speaking there, three different talks. Okay. So now we get that kind of invitations, but we also, you know, look for conferences. We also got invited to Indoor Econ for next year. Yep. I will be in a panel of how to manage different variables okay. inside of that plant factory. And yeah, I really enjoy that too, like to get to know new people and then connect with different companies and also faculty members. Yeah, this year's, I mean, next year's Indoor Icon looks like it's going to be even bigger. I've been to the last two and they're a sponsor of the show. So that we've got a great partnership with them. So we'll get to meet in, in Las Vegas and at, at a nice to meet in person. So it's, it's always fun because I think what's interesting about there is to for me personally, obviously to meet guests and I sometimes get new guests as well, because I'm always meeting new people there. But I think it's also in, so much more interesting to have a slower conversation with people there and get to find out what's working for them in their farms. And then you have different companies talking to each other and meeting each other. And I think the beauty of the conferences is, is that you can really get a feel for what's happening in the industry by talking to the people that are there. And more so than just by watching on social media or just looking at the websites, I think there's something special about being able to see the technologies in person and have the conversations with the people that are, that are making these changes. Yeah. I mean, you get to have great conversations. In my case, I also was part of the panel last year. So after the panels, usually people reach you and, you know, you get to learn about what they are doing and the struggles and everything. So yeah, I think it's, it's, some, it's always good to go to conferences and learn from other people. So with all the things that you have on your plate, one of the questions I like to ask, this may require a little bit of thought, but what's a, a tough question that you've had to ask yourself recently? Tough question related, related to horticulture? Maybe? Just in general with your everything that you have on your plate. <laughs> <laughs> When I'm having children. <laughs> <laughs> That's an important yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just kidding. It's on the plan too. But a difficult question. Well, it's interesting because that, what you said there, it speaks to this idea of what people call work-life balance, right? And how to mm -hmm. prioritizing what's important. And, you know, my partner and I are trying for a child as well. So, you know, you have to think about as much as you have passions that are related to what you do on the day-to-day, you know, we also have families and we also have to balance those because we don't want to make it seem like one 
is out of proportion with the other. So is that something that you think about, like this balance of, am I giving sure. too much and, and, and am I overdoing it? And I like to plan. I'm the, I mean, I'm like obsessed with planning yeah. stuff. So I've been planning this like from years. For example, my, my husband, he's a doctor. So he was uh, studying, you know, doctors, they, the Study time in school is yeah. very long. So when he was still uh, doing his specialization in uh, anesthesia, that's what, when I used to work a lot. He was in other city and I was like, this is the time that I have like to work, you know? And uh, now I try to end my job at 6 p.m. and it's something else like 7 p.m. But after that, I try to be free. And also in the morning, I wake up really early so I can also have time for myself and, and also to exercise, uh, which is also really important. You need to have a balance with that yeah. too. So I think you need to plan in advance because sometimes when you start a business in a point, it's, it's going to demand a lot of time. Mm. So for example, if you are having children, you need to plan in advance. Okay, I will take this time to work a lot, mm. but after this time, I will plan how to do things differently so I can have more time or how to adjust everything so you can, you know, take the, your kids to the conference yeah. or something like that. <laughs> take them to the vertical farming conference. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting because you also want to show by example, because I think about that sometimes, like as they grow up, you don't want to show the example of someone that's not around or not available or does someone just work, work, work. And I think showing your children that example as early as possible because they remember everything you know they remember everything they see as a child and i think about myself as when i was little as well yeah i think that's a, a lot of responsibility so you need to really for me at least i really need to plan that yeah. so i could be a good mother and also to go well in business otherwise yeah. they to the two things cannot work together <laughs> that makes a lot of sense so as we finish you know and, and close this conversation I've been leaving a little bit of space. This podcast is listened to by a lot of CEOs and founders of vertical farming companies. So I'm curious about, you know, if you have a message to the vertical farming industry, you know, given everything that's been happening, the ups and the downs, and you have a unique perspective from your, you know, from the time you have at Hort Americas, what guidance do you have or any words that you have for the leaders that are in vertical farming right now? So I will say to be ambitious on your ideas and your objectives and try to structure your business in that way. A vertical farm doesn't have to, to, to have all the technology at the beginning. So if you're ambitious, that's fine, but try to focalize that on how to structure your business and how to make that work from small size and how to, now that you know how everything is working, do a good investment in something that is bigger. And, it's, you know, the small size it has to do. I mean, you need to do a good, good investment too, you know, on the lambs and uh, things that will make everything work better. Your capex is always important so you can reduce your operational expenses. So think about that, like how did your investment at the beginning is going to help you to reduce the operational expenses that you will have later. And uh, starting with a medium or small size, I think it will be good. And now once you test that and approve, then you can move forward. And I'm sure if uh, anyone, if the listener has questions, they'll be able to reach out for you specifically if they want to learn more, because sure. I'm sure you have a lot of guidance you can provide as well. Sure, sure. So Carla, thank you so much for taking the time to join me on the show. It was really interesting to get a take of what's happening in Mexico specifically, but also from your experience, you've got a lot of experience with everything that you've been learning at Hort America. So I appreciate you coming on and sharing a little bit of your story as well with, with our listener. No, thanks for the invitation. It was fun. Yeah. <laughs> so if people want to learn more and connect with you, where's the best place to send them? You can find my contact in the Fort America's website. Okay. And also I'm in Instagram, okay. Professor Grohl. You okay. can also find me there. And I think that's it. Okay. <laughs> but there's always a place to reach me. You can also get, just leave comments in the in the YouTube channel okay. that we have, and I'll, we'll also get those. <laughs> okay. If I didn't get those from you when we signed up or when you signed up for this call, then just make sure to send me, the, if you want to email me those links, and I'll make sure we put them in the show notes, and then we have them available when this episode goes live. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I will share those with you. Okay. Thanks again. I really appreciate it. No, thank you.